Good morning, and welcome to the East Lutheran Fellowship on this uh, weather. It's 11th Sunday after Pentecost. It's a beautiful summer morning. The fog's lifting, and we're going to continue in John 6 and talking about Jesus as the bread of life. Jesus tells us, I am the bread of life, and I provide life to the world. So uh, we'll be talking about that. That said, let us begin our worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of man, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help, help us. us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Now hear the good news. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into eternal life. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O oh God, eternal goodness, immeasurable love, you place your gifts before us. We eat and are satisfied. Fill us and this world in all its need with the life that comes only from you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Oh, 
Old Testament lesson comes from Exodus 16. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, where we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you. And each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way, I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. Word of God, word of life. Praise to you, God. Psalm 78, 23 to 29. all and through all and in all. 
But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. And therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children, tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. Word of God. Word of life. Thanks. 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 Please stand if you are able for the gospel affirmation. <laughs> the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then he said, then they said to him, what must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. So they said to him, what sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What works are you our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And who believes in me will never be thirsty. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. In our uh, couple of our lessons today, there there's some. Uh, phrases of things we must do, right? So as I was looking at this, there's a couple of deals. In, there's a deal in Ephesians of what we must do. There's a, a Jesus um, answers a question when the uh, crowd asks him, what must we do? Uh, so when you think about um, must do's, there's also the, the flip side of the get to do's. And I was thinking of this in, in regards to the mat maturity that uh, Paul is talking about in Ephesians, right? When you're young, you get to do a lot of things. You get to, you know, have a, if you're in a good environment, right? You're protected, you're fed, 
You don't have to worry about what you eat. It just comes like manna from heaven on the kitchen table there, right? Nobody knows who cooks dinner and how hard that is, right? It's all provided. The finances are good usually. And, and in, in this kind of environment, uh, there's significant growth and nurturing and it's a protected environment, right? And that's why it's so um, traumatic for children if they're raised in any other kind of environment where their needs uh, their food, their uh, care, and concerns, and their nurturing are not met, right? There, there's significant harm that happens. So we know that we are meant uh, as youngsters to be nourished uh, and to uh, be provided an environment in which we can grow into the people we are meant to be, right? That is what uh, raising children is about. That's what I do, try to do with Noel, is to provide an environment that uh, fosters her confidence, that fosters her joy, that fosters her ability to be able to uh, interact with a world that can be very strange and hard and difficult at times, right? Uh, and right now, where we're at with our puppy, the Mighty Oatmeal. The Mighty Oatmeal is a big girl now, right? She's about 13 months old. She's big, she's strong, she's bigger than the other dogs, she's stronger than the other dogs, she's more driven than the other dogs, right? But, so she's been provided this environment where her confidence can grow, where she gets to play all these games, she gets to do a lot of things. But now, we gotta get her to must do some things, right? She must not bite us. She must not jump and, uh, you know, knock us down and lick me in the face all the time because it's too much. She's too big, she's too strong. She was, she's still acting like a puppy. She doesn't know that she's this big, strong creature that she is, right? And, and it's no different with us and our personal faith, right? As we think of uh, where, when we have been nurtured in our faith, when we have been in an environment that allows for us personally to grow in, uh, you know, that is, is what is necessary. But there's a call that we don't stay in that place of infancy. But as uh, the, the people of God, we are called to be a part of the world, and the world very different than the nurturing, caring place that is meant to be our own environment. And I think of Peace Lutheran Fellowship in this regard. You know, when I took the call at Peace Lutheran Fellowship, it was meant to be a time when it was going from its infancy into its growth, right? The infancy of being protected, of being supported by leadership of the Senate and the nationwide, a significant amount of funding, right? Like everything just came from other places for the most part. And there was a significant amount of a controlled environment. And one of the things that I heard that was often hurtful for me is, you know, things aren't the same anymore, Brad. It used to be good, but things aren't the same anymore, right? We used to have fun at peace. You come along and nothing's no fun anymore. You come along and everything. But when we think about it, think about this. The world changed. Are you the same person you were five years ago? Are you in the same context you were five years ago? Are you, um, you know, does the, your friends and family and all your relationships and whatever ventures you are working in function like they did five years ago? No, they don't because the world has changed. We have changed. And when uh, peace was in this emphasis, it was a happy time, right? You guys got to have a lot of fun and joy. But when I came, the world came with me. Right? The world came and said, this is a different time. This is a time to grow up. And I tried my hardest to do that. I tried my hardest to provide just that staple of God's word in the most basic functional way possible and just stick to the things that we know are nurturing, that we know will grow our faith, that will make us strong to be able to be the people in this community that is mature and able to uh, carry God's word to it. Uh, Luther says this, um, he says, you have often, when you're talking about this text of John, he says, you have often heard me exhort you not to dispute or reason about sublime spiritual matters concerning the articles of the Christian faith. As soon as a person ventures to rationalize these things, to brood over them, try to make them conform to reason all is lost and advanced and we are doomed right so we're looking at a passage today 
Now we're going to be uh, going through John 6 more and more, and, and Jesus just begin, begins to crank up the offensiveness of his teaching, right? At first, he's just coming in, and uh, he says, you know, I'm the bread of life. And then he's going to say, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. That's where we're going to get. And he's eventually going to get rejected by these people he's talking to. But right now, in this snapshot, uh, he's speaking to them. And what we see is this conversation is happening in Capernaum. It's across the Sea of Galilee from where Jesus performed the miracle of feeding the 5,000. He walks across the water, right? And uh, he retreated for a while, and then the disciples took boats, and they, um, Jesus, remember, he walked across the water, and the next day the crowd realized that they were gone. And they got into the boats, they went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And in there, Jesus begins to have this conversation with them. And the people ask him, Rabbi, why did you come here? And Jesus then responds, telling them that they weren't seeking, or when did you come here? And, and Jesus says uh, that these people, they weren't seeking him. They weren't trying to be with Jesus because um, of what they saw Jesus do, the miraculous words of feeding 5,000. But they were simply there because their stomachs were filled and they ate and they felt good. So might as well come back for a free meal, right? And uh, so they ask him, when did you come here? And then they ask him another question. And they ask him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Like, what is it specifically we have to do? Just lay it out. Give us a, you know, a couple, you know, points on these tasks that we need to complete to do the work of God. And then they ask him in a sort of uh, not direct way, what are you going to do for us, Jesus? What, are you, what sign are you going to give us to prove to us that you are who you are? And Jesus answers them, though, and he says that the work of God, the things that you need to do to do the work of God, is to believe in the one whom God sent, which is Jesus, God's son. And then they ask him, well, what sign do you give us? What work do you perform? And then they explain to him how Moses gave their fathers bread from heaven to eat. And then Jesus turns the heat up on them and he lays into them and says, you know, it isn't uh, Moses who gave you the bread. It wasn't Moses. It was God who gave you the bread. But Jesus uh, tells them, in order to do the work of God, you must believe in the one that he sent. And so Jesus tells us we need to believe and come and receive him. So how do we do that? How do we believe something? Can you even make yourself believe something? I don't know. It's just you kind of do or you don't. But we believe and receive him simply as one receives bread. Right? You believe it's bread. You eat it. You receive it. When we come forward and communion, we are given this uh, a, a, a bread that is tangible, um, you know, the type of bread people eat every day. But it is also spiritually significant in which we bring in uh, Christ himself into our very being. So what we see here, though, is that we receive uh, Christ through God's initiation. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I have come down from heaven and initiated with you. I have come. And in the beginning of John, it says that God, uh, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, tabernacled amongst us. And then it goes on when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and he says that God so loved the world that he sent the Son. And God is seeking uh, those who would come to him, and he initiates by sending his Son to them, by sending uh, and through us, sending his people to them. We also receive through God's grace. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I give life to the world. It is me who is the author of life, who provides the sustenance, the true sustenance, the spiritual sustenance that we need. And then we see that this is motivated by God's divine love. Whoever comes to him will never be hungry. 
whoever believes in him will never be thirsty. Right? The King James has a better term for this, whosoever. The whosoever. And uh, there's this couple bands that used to be really good rock, well, they are good rock bands, right? They had a lot of problems. A band called Corn, right? One of the guys, the guitarist, uh, fell apart. And he found Jesus during that, right? So he's a part of with these other groups, and they call themselves the Whosoevers, right? Because that's all we are. That's all I am. I'm just a Whosoever. Anybody who Whosoever responds, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter what is going on, Whosoever receives the bread of life, receives life from God. And this comes through God's divine love and God's initiation with and so Jesus uses very strong language here. He says that he has come down from heaven, and what he is saying is he does not provide bread, but that he is the bread. And Jesus says twice in our lesson, I am the bread of life. And there's a lot behind this, right, of what Jesus is saying. When you think of bread, um, this is first of Jesus' first of the I am statements where he equates himself to the divinity of God, I am. But also we see that um, this bread, of course, is a very important staple of the people, right? When you think of bread, you think of um, your, your daily food. Uh, when they thought of bread, they thought of it as their whole you know, kind of sustenance. We call it chicken, right? In my hood, we call it chicken. You gotta mind your chicken, not your money, your food, everything, right? But they would use the bread for that sort of thing. But bread is also very, very symbolic. Uh, it's symbolic in Genesis 3, after Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, God says to Adam, by the sweat of your face, you will eat bread. Like, you're not going to get bread for free anymore. You're going to have to work for it. It's going to come through thorns and thistles. Uh, bread is equated uh, with their food, of course, but it's also equated with their work, right? That is how we uh, survive. And through sweat, God says, is how you're going to survive. And that's no different in ministry, right? It, it is through sweat that we will survive and grow. Uh, but also in the temple, there's 12 piece, pieces of showbread. There's the unleavened Passover bread. And you remember when Jesus was tempted by the devil, he was tempted, and one of the temptations was to turn stones to bread, to feed himself in that sort of way. And of course, we think of the Lord's Supper with the bread and the wine as a symbolic of, of Jesus' body and his blood. But Jesus tells the crowd that God gave their fathers perishable, perishable bread, but that I provide you imperishable bread, imperishable, eternal bread that leads to eternal life. And Jesus says, that is myself, that is my word, that is my gospel, that is every essence of who I am is to fill you and feed you, right? And so what we see is that Jesus is this life-giving bread. He says, I come from heaven, from God himself, that I would come and live amongst you, and I would uh, give myself and my entire life so that you could be brought into a relationship with God and restored to health and built up as the person you were created to be. And that is no different corporately as well, right? We are called corporately, and we are given weekly Jesus' bread of his word, of, of his forgiveness, of worship, and of all the things that we receive so that we can be made whole as a corporate body, and that we may share this in a healthy way with our community. In Exodus, we see that God gives the Israelites manna, and the reason God does that is because everybody's complaining, right? Everybody's sitting around going, God, you took us out of Egypt. It, was, it wasn't any good in Egypt, but at least it was better than here, <laughs> right? That's all they could say is, is Egypt stunk, but it's better than here. We were fed. We weren't, we weren't vulnerable. We didn't know what was going to happen. You know, it, it, we knew what our lives were like. And because of that, we can learn how to live within that. Out in the desert, 
You have to learn to live a whole other way. You have to learn to survive a whole other way. And so they were nervous. They were concerned and they were uh, beginning to complain, God, why would you bring me here in order to kill us and starve us? Is what they were complaining about. Why would they do that? That's often where we find ourselves uh, in, in the faith, right? That God nourishes us. I know my life, my life of faith was like that. At the beginning, I was nourished, I was filled, I had all these things. And then at some point along the way, I found myself in the desert going, God, why'd you take me out of this cool life I used to have with all these friends and good times and things I used to build to do to make me come here and starve and die in the desert? Right? But those are just momentary times. And God says, I'm just uh, working on you. I'm keeping you alive. I'm keeping you sustained so that I can form you in the way you are needed that is necessary for you to be my people in this world. And what we see in Ephesians is uh, Paul, he does something I think I do every week. He comes out and he says, I beg you. Right? He says, I beg you. Lead a life worthy of the calling in which you have been called. I beg you to do this, right? And if you think about what's going on in Ephesians, their main issue is a conflict. It's a conflict of ethnicity between uh, Jewish Christians and um, Gentile Christians, right? And he says, I beg you, lead a life worthy of what God has called you to. And you do this, the, the life we are called to lead is a life of humility, a life of gentleness, a life of patience, a life of bearing with one another in love, a life of making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Right? And we do this because we, when we recognize that there's one body, one spirit, one hope, one calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, who is above all, in all, and through all. Right? And that is what we are called to in maturity, is to be these kind of people, people who are gentle, people who are loving, people who are willing to bear with one another, people who recognize that we have one God, one baptism, one faith. And are able to be reconcilers of all those uh, teachings and things that cause us to become divided, right? And as our lives and community reflect this, as we grow in spiritual maturity, we begin to equip the saints for the work of ministry. We're building up the body of Christ, right? The work that we are called to do as peace, live, and fellowship is to build up the body of Christ until we can all get along. Right? Until we all come into a place of, of a unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Right? Our work is to be gentle, is to be kind and uh, long-suffering and bearing with one another in love, uh, and to make every effort for unity rather than causing division. Right? And, and we're told as we do this, as we, as we uh, ground ourselves in a mature faith like that, uh, we'll no longer be children tossed to and fro, blown about by every wind of doctrine. Right? We, we won't be subject to whatever comes along, the next new thing, the next new issue, the next new uh, movement to be a part of. Right? We won't be uh, led astray by people's trickery, by their craftiness, or any deceitful scheme. But what we are called to do, and what Paul tells us we are called to do, is speak the truth in love and grow up in every way into him who is the head, who is Jesus Christ, right? And speaking the truth in love, that is what we are called to do, and that's a very difficult task, right? Um, you know, I come from a military, as I told you a million times, I come from a military family, but speaking the truth is a necessity. That is all that happens in my house. The love part was entirely absent, right? There was no love. When you have truth with no love, it's only harsh. It can only come across as either uh, condemning or motivating, and that motivates us, right? It make us work harder, but eventually it just drives us in a bad way because we're not motivated out of love. We're just motivated out of whatever truth we are told, right? But if we just have love with no truth, we're in an infancy, right? And that's kind of what infancy is. It's just being a loving environment, a caring, provisional environment. 
and you kind of keep the truth of the harshness of the world, the truth of what it's like, the truth of things uh, out of the minds of the children because you're protecting them. But what we are called as a people of God is to be mature both in ourselves and in our body, our community. And, and by doing that, we do that by speaking the truth in love. It says the whole body is joined and knit together by every rhythm. Right? We are joined together. We, we are connected. We, if whether we want to be or not, whether we choose to be uh, connected or not, might be a part of our um, personal choices. But regardless, we're still connected in this spiritual sense of the body of Christ. And we are joined and knit together by every ligament which it is equipped. As part of it is working properly, right? as our body works properly, it will promote the body's growth and we will build ourselves up in love. And that's what Paul tells us through this as we receive Jesus as the bread of life. A Luther, another quote he has, a little longer one from this uh, sermon that he gave on John 6. He says this, and I'll close with this. You have often heard me exhort you not to dispute or reason or argue with them. If you have Christ, in whom I have asked you to believe, you have eternal life, and you will be delivered from eternal death. If we are free from eternal death, we are also free from temporal death. And all of the debts and obligations involved in temporal debts, such as sin, are wiped out. And if sin is removed, the law too is gone. And if the law is done away with and fulfilled, God's judgment and wrath are also gone. Devils, death, and hell are eliminated, and all is settled and arranged. Otherwise, this cannot be called eternal life. <laughs> Luther goes on, he says, Now, if you believe in Christ, you have all of this. Hell has been subdued, sin is renewed, death is overcome, and eternal righteousness, blessedness, and life are yours. Who can fully evaluate such a treasure? And then Lewis there gives a little statement, I'll leave you with this. You will assuredly experience someday that I did not mislead you about the value of faith. Let us consider that. Right.
standing or seated. <laughs> Let's confess our faith together according to the Apostles' Word. <clears throat> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the Amen. Calling on the Holy Spirit to help us discern the mind of Christ. Let us pray for the church, the world, and all. Triune God, your loyal love toward us is evident since the foundation of the world. Fill us with your Spirit so that we may imitate your love and faithfulness toward one another and all our neighbors. Merciful God, because of Jesus, Keep our prayer. Creator God, you alone are the source of all life, and you are alone our salvation. Fill us with your spirit so that we may serve your interests with single-minded devotion. Merciful God, because of Jesus, receive our prayer. Sovereign God, enable the leaders of this world to learn your wisdom so that they may seek peace, resist violence, tap down their self-interest, and use their political authority to help the poor, powerless, the least, the last, Bring shame to those who do not. Merciful God, because of Jesus. Precious Lord Jesus, you are our bread from heaven who feeds and fills us with abundant life. Fill us now with your spirit so that we may hunger and thirst for your righteousness. Grow us up in Christ. Merciful God, because of Jesus, receive our prayer. Holy Spirit, descend upon this congregation, Peace Lutheran Fellowship. Give to us your gifts of mission and ministry. Baptize us into your power to replace our fears with courage, our hatred of others with love, our apathy toward your reign with renewed commitment to your kingdom. Merciful God, because of Jesus. Healing God. We humbly admit we are a needy congregation. There are dear friends among us who are sick and need healing. Others who are caring for loved ones who face hard times and end times. Join with these and their medical teams to help those who seek healing. They might find comforting mercy in time of their need. We name them now Fred and Jean, Bill and Barb, Al and members of his family, Cynthia as she recovers from surgery and Marlene as she faces surgery. Now let us name still other friends, neighbors, and family aloud or in our hearts who need healing. Merciful God, because of Jesus. Receive our prayer. We pray as well for those who are lonely and need friendship. 
who despair because they need hope, who are hungry and homeless and need food and shelter. May we be generous toward them as you are toward us. Merciful God, because of Jesus. Receive us through our prayer. Triune God. Let me remind you of your promise to never leave us or forsake us. Find us now, Lord, even as we seek you now. Help us limp into your embrace right now, today, loving Lord. Merciful God, because of Jesus, we lift up these intercessions to you with grateful hearts. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Let us share that peace with one another. Peace. <laughs> God's peace. peace. <laughs> Now we continue our worship with Gibby. who on this day overcame death and grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
harmonious world of your creation, the plants and animals, the sea and stars were whole and well in your praise. When sin had scarred the world, you sent your son to heal our ills and to form us again into one. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his acts of healing, his body given up, and his victory over death, we await that day when all the people of the earth will come to the river to enjoy the tree of life. Send your spirit upon us and this meal. As grains scattered on the hillside become one bread, so let your church be gathered from the ends of the earth, that all may be fed with the bread of life, your Son. Through him all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. It is here where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And as we come and receive uh, the broken body, shed blood, the bread and wine, we are given life and the life of the world. And we are, uh, so anybody who would come and receive this meal would come and receive the bread of life is welcome. Come, taste, and see that the Lord is good. Come.
And so we had a little, first time I ever made this mistake, but uh, gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. Ours as well. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come to the study, drive it, you know, bring it, bring it to the end, and it will be in the sermon for better or for worse. So you got to be careful, right? <laughs> <laughs> With that being said, now receive the blessing. The blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 